All right, uh, today is September the 25th, 2012. Uh, we're at the, during the uh, final lap of uh, an election this year. Uh, on November 6, 2012, people have a big decision to make. I mean, is it gonna be a shot heard around the world where we elect as many independents and third parties, the best qualified candidates to the Congress as possible this year? Or is it just going to be going around the vicious circle again, we'll find out. Uh, but today uh, we're doing interviews where you'll find uh, interviews at libertarianprogressive.com um, of independent third party candidates such as Chip Peterson. And uh, and uh, he's running uh, for district number 19 against uh, uh, an incumbent, Randy Nugbauer, uh, who voted for the National Defense Authorization Act as, as one of the acts that, um, you know, he did, um, basically voting against the Constitution. I mean, that's about as much of a vote against the Constitution and um, historical precedents for due process as you can get. So, I mean, just kind of just throwing it all away, just all those efforts and struggles people did throughout the centuries. I've died and spilt their blood and, you know, who'd rather stand on two feet than die on their knees. I mean, he just, you know, basically voted against all that. And and so Congress does have a 10% approval rating. Now it's time to really reflect it, hold these people accountable by, um, by, you know, what we can do, which I think is the path of least resistance for truth, is um, through the House of Representatives, through Congress. Um, every two years we can elect someone new, and we do have to have people in position, and Chip is. Chip, if you, welcome, Chip, and uh, thank you so much for doing this interview and your time and giving people an option and letting them know uh, more about yourself to be more informed. Um, uh, and so you're a libertarian running for District 19. You have one competitor. Um, and uh, if you could tell us about District 19, what got you motivated, and just a little quick, um, you know, biographical summary, sir. Okay, well, let me tell you, you just hit one of the major reasons I'm motivated this time around, and that is because uh, Congressman Nagavar not only voted for the National Defense Authorization Act, but when the particularly obnoxious part of that act, uh, the uh, Section 1021 was brought up for explicitly a vote. He voted uh, against taking that out. And of course, that is a part of the part act that takes away our right of habeas corpus and lets the military to be used against so uh, civilians the in, the, in the U.S. He so. broke his oath twice, in other words. He denied the Constitution twice. Actually, he denied it three times because there are several votes on the act, yes, and he voted for it every time. He voted for the act with its unconstitutional. It's just like Peter denying, you know, Jesus, you know, like, <laughs> I called on you and you denied me. He denied the Constitution just that outright three times, but this was an actual vote. Well, you know, I've run against him before, and, and I, one time in 2004 he debated me, and uh, I basically criticized him on a couple points, one that he was a big spender, and he has gotten a little bit better on that. Um, and I told him that he'd gotten better you know, a few years ago. But uh, the other thing I criticized him on was the Patriot Act and you know, defending that. And, uh, and, of course, then we got a new version of the Patriot Act that had to be renewed. And um, you know, this version, if anything, is probably worse than the one before. And that, of course, denies the Fourth Amendment rights of people, allows uh, search and seizure of uh, their property without a warrant in advance. Um, and probable cause. So uh, this is something that uh, is also very serious. So the Patriot Act under, over, also overrules some of our uh, protections that we are guaranteed under the Bill of Rights. So I'm very concerned that uh, he has not protected our constitutional guarantees because I see us going down, well, if you've read The Road to Serfdom, that's where we're heading. And uh, particularly, uh, if you read, and everybody should read, they'll be scared out of their wits, they should read the executive order Obama passed on March 16th of this year, 2012, because in that executive order he takes pretty much dictatorial policies based on this National Defense Authorization Act. Um, he has powers there that would make uh, Stalin and Hitler jealous in terms of declaring somebody a terrorist, and uh, you know they might disappear with no charge, no uh, nobody hears from them again. Well, it's an abomination, and it's an abomination. I mean, um, it, it's just uh, it's 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 an abomination, and um, spelled that 
you know, AB instead of OB. Um, it, it, it just really is that, it, you know, especially from someone who's a constitutional scholar. I mean, it's like, you know, it, it just had to be a constitutional scholar who does all this. And um, of course, um, I mean, it, it couldn't be written better um, almost if it was like a, a nightmare story. Um, but, uh, you know, truth is stranger than fiction. And um, so, I, I mean, being a libertarian, I think people like probably guess like, you know, or might guess where they think you stand on. Um, uh, you know, you're appealing to people that, you know, identify themselves as independent and uh, Republican and Democrats and, and probably green and, and, and everything else. Um, I mean, what, what, what do you say to um, your fellow uh, Texans there in District 19, sir? Well, I think if they are concerned with overregulation, which is killing our economy, and if they're concerned with the tax burden and, you know, the overly difficult tax burden that they have, we need a much simpler tax system. We need to have, get rid of all the bureaucrats that double-check everything you do and keep you from do, using your own property the way you wish. Uh, I think they ought to vote for a libertarian because we're for small government and minimum interference in people's lives. And, uh, you know, if you have less government and minimal interference in people's lives, it's cost less, so you can probably get taxes down. At the very least, you could try to simplify the tax code, so um, you, that would help, too. I, I'm a Ph.D. economist, so I'm concerned with all the waste of money that goes on at the government level, and I'd like to see that cut back sharply as well. Well, in... in I just want to say a quote here because I just found one um, regarding the Patriot. I mean, the Patriot Act. Um, George Washington quotes: um, "Guard against the postures of pretended patriotism." And um, and and uh, you know that's uh, that pr that could have been a litmus test of who to vote out um, then. But uh, you know there was a lot of decisions made on fear. And uh, so the NDAA has to be, I mean, like you said, it would make Stalin proud. Um, well, the implementing, the implementing order that Obama passed based on that act would make Stalin uh, happy. He wouldn't have to send anybody before a kangaroo court before sending him to the gulag after that. So. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's, an, it's just, um, I mean, it's basically, you know, people can be abduct, abducted abducted uh, basically and, and just taken like you know like an alien abduction or something and uh, never heard from again um, and uh, and that's you know so that's lawlessness that's you know you know I guess anarchy and tyranny uh, mixed together um, you know they're the ones who are the lawless anarchists um, basically not the libertarians uh, what about you know the wars um, what about empire versus republic how do you see America's role in the world well, I tend to agree with Ron Paul pretty much, and that is that uh, we need a strong national defense, but we don't need to interfere in everybody else's business. And I, I don't know why we have, you know, a couple hundred thousand troops in Germany. They're capable of defending themselves. We have 30,000 people, I think, on the front lines in Korea. I don't think we need to do that. We could have a... You know, we could have a base at the back that had, uh, you know, some nuclear bombs just in case they needed to retaliate against the North for using one. Um, yeah, those troops aren't helping any. I mean, we could just have, you know, some other form of retaliation that would be just as effective. And people might not think I'm an expert, but what do you think, of the, which leads me to the next question, what do you think about transparency and accountability and, and freedom of information? Um, basically what Jefferson said, um, you know, uh, an, an educated and informed public is necessary for, uh, you know, a free society, a democ democratic republic, a democracy. Well, I completely agree with that. Jefferson was a brilliant man, and he was right. Uh, you know, and I think this idea they want to punish WikiLeaks for airing their dirty laundry, I think, uh, is kind of too bad, because we ought to know what our government is doing and trying to hide from us. So, yeah, we need as much transparency as possible. And uh, Yeah, some whistleblowers were, you know, like there's a whistleblower not too long ago who broke, you know, the, the uh, leaks about the Swiss bank accounts, and, and he ended up getting rewarded like a million dollars or something like that and uh six so, million dollars oh six million yeah and then there's other ones i guess that you know gets um you know no speedy trial or any anything like that and uh um so uh, you know may, maybe you know he he'll be let go because of that because of just that violation of due process or something and um you know there could be some kind of a 
you, you know, I don't, I don't know, some kind of leniency or whatever. But um, uh, it's, uh, but I can, uh, you know, um, the the real traders, I guess, if people want to talk about traders and stuff, are um, people that are, you know, trading away our rights and our liberties. People that would, um, you know, want to even envision a society where, you know, someone could live where they could be indefinitely detained, not have that due process, this long historical precedence of. Um, that's been refined because of uh, people's actions um, and because um, learning from the past and not repeating vicious cycles. Um, and uh, so, you know, hopefully we don't have to start from the Stone Age. What about the, um, the drug war? Um, what, what, you know, if you could expand and tell us about that and also, I guess, industrial hemp and, and just the whole uh, criminal justice system in the United States. Okay, well, you just made a good point about when people are scared, they tend to give up some of their liberties. And Ben Franklin pointed out that, you know, if you lose give up some of your liberty, you're going to both, both lose your liberty and your freedom, and uh, you're going to, you know, lose your ability, you know, well, your future welfare, in a sense. So, so the problem with the drug war is I think people ought to be able to make their own decisions if they're adults, and, uh, you know, I, I don't think, I don't take drugs, I don't, wouldn't want my kids to take drugs, but I told them from the time they were little they shouldn't because they might damage their brains and they needed them. But uh, on the other hand, I don't like the war on drugs. I mean, that's used as an excuse to, for people to invade other people's property and to use force against them, to compensate their property, a lot of things that basically are, would be illegal if they were done by anyone other than government. Uh, so I am very opposed to the drug war and I have seen, you know, people, I had students in class at one time that were let out from the penitentiary to because, so they could get uh, some education, but they were in there because they'd taken marijuana once, and it ruined their lives, it made them a felon. And these were good young people. I mean, it's just ridiculous. People ought to be able to make their own choice once they're adults. Um, and so I'm, I'm opposed to the drug war. I think that... You know, some people are going to screw up and they're going to hurt their brains, and but other people are going to observe that and say, I, hey, I don't want to take drugs. Um, that's what my kids did. They saw their friends uh, have problems and they avoided it. So, yeah, you know, it helped that they... I warned them from the time they were little. But uh, when they saw that they actually could hurt themselves, they they wouldn't do it. And uh, I think you got to leave it up to individual choice uh, and rather than have government dictate every aspect of your behavior. So I'm... Don't like the uh, I don't like the war on drugs. We had up there in Tulia, which is uh, real close to Lubbock, um, a case where you know uh, one of the drug uh, officials or anti-drug officials uh, falsely accused 56 people, mostly minorities, um, about taking drugs or and so forth. And you know, fortunately, the ACLU took the case and got them off. But uh, you know. It, they were in jail for a long time, and it cost the state then to have to pay them for uh, improper imprisonment as well. So uh, I just think the whole thing is better left to individual choice. Yeah, it's, 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 I mean, you could make an argument that the government should protect their right to do that, if anything, if that's what they want to do, if someone is, you know, forcibly trying to stop them. I mean, education's another thing, but um, that well, might Well, I be... think, you know, if people take drugs, uh, they probably should, rather than go to jail, just uh, go to see what happens to people who take drugs. My son is a psychiatrist. He's worked with people who've been in prison and had mental problems, and he says, you know, taking methamphetamines actually destroys uh, part of the bra brain that allows them to exercise judgment. It says if you see an MRI, that part of the brain is gone along with their gums, which well, you see in heaven. Think about what it does, though, if it's like, you know, marijuana or something like that. If, if um, you know, kids are separated from their parents or someone spends, you know, that amount of time in jail or, you know, someone loses their house. Too. I mean, if kids need parents as long as their parents are, love them and take care of them and don't abuse them. Yeah, and... Um, it, it, it definitely. I mean, people should, it should be an education thing. And, you know, in um, Portugal, um, you know, the drug rate has gone down because of legalization. Legalized it and went down in Netherlands where it's basically legal. It's not a, not a serious problem either. Yeah, I mean, so it seems like, you know, it, it, it's not a government issue. It's more a societal issue. And uh, it, the solutions seem to be sometimes 
uh, more of a problem than the actual problem because well, it's definitely more of a problem I mean like all these falsely accused people and people who are incarcerated just for you know having a couple smokes on a joint I mean it's uh, it doesn't make any sense at all. Well, we're introducing a lot of problems to problems. Like, we introduced a problem to the problem when we bailed out, you know, all those companies, like, in 2008 that were too big to fail. That's basically another example where we presented a problem with an even bigger problem. Like, hey, these people just, um, you know, made horrible decisions that made their companies go bankrupt instead of letting instead of having you know it's kind of like a trust busting but um but uh, by bankruptcy and, and letting small mid-sized banks possibly buy them up or, or just whatever um well they, they could have broken them up the thing is about financial firms it's not like having specialized machinery when they fail you just pay off their debtors at a reduced rate so i mean they could they could go down the tubes and it wouldn't be a big problem you might have to provide extra liquidity, but the Fed did that anyway as, we, as you rearrange them and sell off the pieces and fire all the dumb managers at the top instead. Right. That's all an these important aspect right there. Yeah. Bonuses and saying they're best and the brightest when they're really stupid. Oh, yeah. And everything, you know, I'm sure it happens in the FBI. I'm sure it happens like lots of places. Um, that's a, uh, you know, reward. The, you know, the, the bad and the behavior and, uh, you, you know, punish the good behavior. Um, it's, uh, uh, that, that, that's what, you know, I guess that's just human decision and just getting people that with, you, you know, who are on the right side here. And um, so everything we mentioned so far, like the drug war, um, you know, military spending overseas, um, our excursions, our empire uh, acting, um, it, it's if you counted up all the savings of stopping all that, um, you know, we would be getting a lot closer to a balanced budget. Too. We sure would, and there are a lot of regulatory things. If you went back to the Constitution like Ron Paul does and, and vote against anything that was not, you know, uh, called for by our Constitution, you'd shrink the government by a whole lot. And um, what about, um, you know, abortion? Um, where do you stand on that uh, topic? I'm a libertarian, so I believe most people should have freedom of choice. There's a problem with abortion is exactly when is a person a person. Uh, you know, and to some right. extent, there's a theological difference there. Historically, people used to say a person is a person when they're born. Now, under the Roe v. Wade law, they're considered to have, you know, individual rights from the time, you know, the last three months of pregnancy because they potentially could live if they were born. I'm opposed to late-term abortion because of that. Um, in terms of early abortion, I, I don't think that, uh, say, the day-after pill is, uh, is a problem. That's uh, not abortion. Right? In fact, Ron Paul clarified that as a doctor. What it does is prevent the pregnancy. Like the morning-after pill, basically, it prevents the um, conception. It, it, it's, uh, it, it basically prevents it from happening, so it's, it's not an abortion. Well, that's right. Well, I tend to agree with Ron Paul on that one. So, uh, you know, I have, you know, but it's, there's kind of a continuum there, you know, so it's a, it is an, it's a difficult issue because it's a question of when is a person uh, subject to protection of the law. Um, and, you know, like Ron Paul says, before it's implanted, clearly there's, there's not a person growing there. There's possibly a person. But if you think about it, uh, Probably at least one third of all pregnancies end up uh, spontaneous abortions. Anyway, I know that's true with part. Oh yeah, and the reason why Roe v. Wade did what it did is because pe women were having abortions in back streets and stuff like that, right? So, and they they had terrible ways they did it. And you know, I mean, my my wife had a friend when we lived in Dallas who uh, you know had taken some kidney drugs or something and had to get try to get an abortion because it would hurt the fetus and she unbeknownst to her she had twins and one of them was eliminated and the other kid was like one of these flipper babies i mean you know he lived only three years and had all kinds of problems in those three years so you know sometimes you just you know the person would be better off if they just had not been born and having so many difficulties now what about um you know, Social Security, I mean, um, do you do, do think people who want it should be able to keep it? And, you know, is there means testing, or should we just Well, I've it? advocated that for a long time. I wrote a book on Social Security, and that's how I got into politics, because I said, you know, we got to do something before the baby boomers start retiring, because what, basically, it's in trouble because the retirement 
uh, age is too low relative to how healthy people are now. And uh, they're living longer, and they, you know, they are going to draw on the retirement system a lot longer than expected. So we need to raise the retirement age. That went over like a lead balloon, but it's really realistic, and that eventually is going to have to happen um, because people are living longer. And... Uh, and they are draining the system. And the other thing is, since they haven't fixed it before baby boomers have started retiring, uh, they probably will go to some form of means testing because that's the only other alternative. Unfortunately, when they started the Social Security system, uh, most people were opposed to it because they said if it becomes a welfare system, then it's going to lose public support. But that's what it's going to be, is a welfare system for poor old people. And that's going to have a deleterious effect because people then won't save for their own uh, retirement because they figure, well, I'm not going to be doing that much better, and if I save too much, they are going to take away my Social Security, I may end up in the hole. <laughs> well, I mean, they I guess they could in gold, right? But they, they it, no one trusts the market now. I mean, no one, the, everyone believes this, you know, the, the stock market is rigged. Um, and, um, I mean, it, it's the, 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 the trust is kind of, it needs to be regained. I'll just say that, um, you know, there needs to be more trust and, uh, accountability and, um, and, and knowing the numbers, um, you know, being able to see the numbers and, um, you know, more transparency. And, uh, so I, I mean, maybe, you know, there could be a future where people do save more and, um, and also, you, you know, just see that as an option, but not as something that they have to do or anything like that, you know? Oh, I think, if, I think what you got to eventually, what's going to happen is Social Security is going to be a fairly low payment for people who are really needy. And if people want to live better, they're going to have to save. And so, you know, you make it the option for people who've already been counting on Social Security, you don't want to jerk it away from them. So people who are, you know, like 50 or 55 or somewhere in that range, uh, who have been counting on it and haven't saved up to this point ought to be able to count on Social Security. But younger people ought to be able to have a savings plan of their own um, so that they can accumulate real assets that they can call on and use when they retire. Yeah, and there's, I mean, do you think, you know, I, I don't know, like people over a certain age have, well, this is more of a local issue that have, um, you, you know, paid off their house or whatever should be able to stop paying property taxes or something that might help people out you know i think some states probably have stuff like that anyways i'm pretty sure well you know they have uh in texas they have a homestead law and, and they stop at least in our local jurisdiction they stop raising your property taxes after and your property valuation after your retirement age but uh still you know it's uh the big problem is that People need to have an inducement to save so we accumulate real assets and be able to draw them down when they retire. Um, so uh, you need to, that'll make the economy more productive in the long run, but not when people are not are afraid to invest because of the regulations coming down on their heads every day. Well, yeah, I think, it, it, do you think there should be an order of way to do things? Um, I, I mean, you, you know, I mean, because there have been kind of, you know, a lot of special interests lately, or, uh, I mean, um, it seems like, and even Ron Paul voted to keep Glass-Steagall just because, you know, we still had the FDIC, so, I mean, having that, he felt like that we had to have it because of that reason alone, um, but if we didn't have that, then maybe we wouldn't have needed Glass-Steagall. Well, we need glass steel, and we need to have the bankers, especially the big bankers, play with their own money. In other words, they need to have more of their own capital at stake, and above that capital, they need to also have subordinated debt that they borrow from the marketplace. Only the big bar bankers can do that, but they're the ones who are the most risky right now anyway. And if they start taking too much risk, uh, the people who would be buy their bonds in the marketplace aren't going to buy them. So it's a good single signal to the FDIC that they've got a problem. It's also a signal to the stockholders that they've got a bad management in that bank and maybe they should change it. So the main thing is make people play with their own money rather than with money that is provided by depositors and uh, who don't care about whether the bank fails or not because they know the FDIC will bail them out. You have to have people who will lose something if the bank is stupid. Oh, yeah. And right now we don't because we bail out the bank and all the depositors so they don't care. Um, when I taught banking, I we had a bank that was very weak in town, and they used to have to issue their call reports, and 
everybody knew this bank was weak, but, uh, you know, when it failed, there were only nine people in the bank with deposits over $100,000, which was the insurance limit. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's what we call moral hazard. People let the government bail them out knowing that the bank is stupid. But well, do you think we should have more control over our monetary system? And, um, and Definitely. Uh, the Fed, Fed needs to be audited thoroughly um, because they are too much in debt to the great big banks. I worked at the Fed, and, uh, you know, one of the governors told one of my colleagues when he was helping him out on a speech or something, and he said, you know, you really need to let the interest rates go up. This is my colleague. And the governor said, oh, we can't let them go up too fast because that would hurt the investment banks who are the ones that buy the Treasury securities. Well, you know, they, they're kind of in league with these big Wall Street bankers, and that should be made clear. And if they had had to disclose everything, it would be clear. Uh, when I was at the Fed, they used to have kind of the governor's dining room where they would meet with some of the the big ba Wall Street bankers would come there, and sometimes they'd bring in specialists like me to talk to them after they'd had their lunch. But, uh, you know, basically they were being lobbied by the big Wall Street banks. They need to put all those uh, meetings out in the open and have them fully disclosed and uh, try to limit the favors they do for, for the big banks. And, yeah, and if it's something they have to hide, maybe they should come up with a better plan, you know. And um, Well, they should come up with a plan of trying to keep the, the value of real goods constant in terms of the dollar instead of letting inflation develop. I mean, you know, we're, our dollar is worth about three or four cents compared to what it was worth when the Fed was started. Yeah, it'd be real interesting to, you know, hear your thoughts and, and, and your questions towards, like, uh, Ben Bernanke and Timothy Geithner or whoever ends up being there. Um, and uh, uh, it's, so, um, yeah, that's uh, – well, uh, any people that have been on your um, – thoughts lately that you wouldn't mind sharing here in this interview, um, you know, whether someone you've read about or uh, just whatever um, people um, just in general that have been on your mind lately and, 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 and why were they on your mind? Well, I think everybody should read uh, Friedrich Hayek's Road to Serfdom because that's where Obama's taking us. Uh, he was a Nobel Prize winning economist. He makes the case for why free markets are better at central planners at allocating resources. And when the central planners start messing up, then they start getting vicious. And he also has a chapter in there how the worst rise to the top. And I'm afraid we're seeing that. So. You know, if they really want to be, you know, have an idea of how free market economics should work, not with this uh, crony capitalism that we have where the politicians are paid off by the, the big bankers and so forth, and then they provide favors to Solyndra or to the banks or whatever. Uh, where you have competitive capitalism, uh, you're going to have a lot more efficient allocation of resource. The economy will thrive, and that's what our founders established, and that's why we've done well. You also have to follow the rule of law, which, uh, again, that's another chapter in Hayek's book about the importance of the rule of law. And the rule of law is not having lots and lots of laws. It's having consistent laws that apply the same way to everybody. I mean, even if you've given $100,000 to your local candidate, you don't get any breaks. I mean, the same law applies. If you get a speeding ticket, you still get the stick. Yeah, equal rights under the law, um, you know, no one above the law. No exactly. One can having absolute power. Um, no, no bailouts for GM where you give, uh, where you default on the promises they made to their bondholders, which, by the way, those bonds were held by a lot of people's pension funds, and instead give the money to the United Auto Workers, so uh, which they did not have. And yeah, I, if you think about it, part of Ford's money went to GM too. So it's again like competitors giving money directly to their competitors. Um, and of course, Ford didn't, you know, get, ask for the bailouts, and they're the only American auto company I think that didn't receive any. Um, but they, you know, kind of prospered um, on that note. And uh, so um, it, it's, it's, but it's just, you know, we're really paying our competitors, um, and, and we're not buying anything from them. We're they're just getting our money um, without us um, voluntarily giving it to them. I mean, that's the problem, and, and it's a few of them that are well, entrenched in power. Our money and give it to them, but, you know, like with the GM bailout, they didn't give it to the, the non-unionized workers. They only gave it to the unionized workers. <laughs> so oh, that was, well, you know, because the unions well, are the ones that supported yeah. Obama. And, and that's, that's what you can't have is 
paying political favors with taxpayer money. Yeah, and, and rule of law is really, I mean, it's to separate any of these issues. I mean, we need a free market. A free market is a, a free environment. It is free people. It's, um, you, you know, it's, it's saying the exact same thing. I mean, the rule of law builds confidence. I mean, would you want to go and set up your you know, corporation and, um, you know, Syria right now? I, I Probably not. And, or, you know, a lot of other countries, or would you rather it's... I'm thinking about investing here, but I think about all the regulations, oh, and I decide yeah. that maybe I don't want to have a real investment in property, because I, the government would regulate what I could do with it so People much. People should so. only reach their full potential, I believe, at least if they're free. And, uh, and uh, I mean, so what about, you know, should we just scrap the income tax? Should we um, should we have a fair tax like Gary Johnson? The sales tax, basically. Um, should we, um, you know, just um, you know have like a tariffs and import taxes? I mean, what should be the um, you know the mechanism to fund our budget in a constitutional way? Well, I'm afraid that we, if we tried to go for a fair tax based on sales, that we would end up with having that and an income tax. Well, no, only if it was just one or the other. No 999 or any crazy but, idea like that. You know politicians, if they get their nose under they, the table. They would have to get rid of the other one. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah, that would be, and yeah, we don't need two taxes. So. Easiest way to fix what we have would go to a uh, uh, flat tax that had a substantial deduction for people with children and people who were, you know, didn't, not earning much money. But then above that, everybody would pay maybe a 25% rate on income above that deduction level. So it would be easy to figure. It wouldn't be all of that confiscatory. So, uh, you know, you'd have basically a pretty fair way of taxation then, and you would also not burden down the people at the very low end of the income scale or people with a lot of children's support. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, especially the small businesses, because a lot of them are um – you know, thought of as, uh, you know, they, they don't realize it's all part of the same income, and sometimes, you know, they're not taxed too fairly either. And uh, But um, there's, all right, so, yeah, we do need to get out of this budget. Any issues that, you know, we haven't covered yet, um, uh, you know, uh, and that, you, you know, you want to mention here, sir? Well, you know, one of the things that uh, one congressman who is now running for Senate in Arizona used to introduce every year was a bill requiring that everything that passed through Congress uh, state how it related to the U.S. Constitution. I think that was a great idea. I'd want to support that kind of thing. I, I think that our Congress has gotten totally distracted from the U.S. Constitution and is just does all kinds of things to uh, cater to special interests rather than keep their nose on their knitting, which is basically to try to provide only the necess necessary things to have a civil society um, instead of providing handouts here or there, special favors here and there. So I think we need to keep our Congress limited in terms of what it can do as our Constitution initially uh, intended. You know, our founding fathers were really brilliant. You know, they'd had a lot of experience with a lot of different government systems during the uh, period before our Constitution was started and during the time they were colonies, and they knew how government worked, and that's why they wanted to restrain the powers of the central government and let it go back to the states or the Tenth Amendment uh, or to the local level. Uh, they didn't want the federal government to have more than a few and enumerated powers like national defense and... Uh, and they stated a few other things they needed to do as well. Well, but so now of course, I mean, the states are 50 laboratories of freedom, yet they still have to um, adhere to, you know, the Bill of Rights and, 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 and also the Constitution. And all oh, right. The Constitution yeah. applies to everybody. Yeah, That's important. So, I mean, but, but if it's not there and, I mean, if someone hands you, like, you know, a thousand or a couple thousand page bill and ask you to sign it, I mean, you should, you know, probably say no. Um, and uh, hey, You should have very short bills that are... Too maybe they should make, like, Twitter, like, um, you, you know, where you have to, like, write something in 140 characters or less, like, like force these people to, like, you, you know, you can't write something over 50 pages or something and, and just, you know, and, and if it does, then make it part of another bill that's totally separate or something. Like Herman Cain's suggestion, you have three-page bills. I think they have to be a little longer than that, but not much. Yeah, 
You yeah. focus on the main point, and then you or do how that. how long's the Constitution? Like, make it that length, you, you, you know. And um, I wonder, you know, if some of these people have taken the oath to protect and defend the Constitution, an oath, um, which used to be, you know, almost like someone's signature. Um, uh, if the if the Constitution came up for a vote, if if they would have the spine to even vote for it, I'm afraid they wouldn't. I mean, most of them just totally ignore it. So, uh, and that's one reason I'm running is uh, to have somebody who does care about the Constitution in Congress, especially now that Ron Paul isn't running again. We need yeah. to have somebody who supports the Constitution. Well, this, I mean, you've, so you've ran against Randy before, and, um, I mean, and he's the only candidate. I think it's time he gets a real job, and um, and then we send someone in that is doing this that's going to be out of a work of love, um, you know, stuff that you would do for free anyways. Um, I, I mean, not that you should do that, but I'm just saying that. Um, well, you know, I look at it this way. You know, I've gained a lot from being an American citizen, and, you know, I'm willing to give something back. So uh, I think that's what public service should be. Yeah, and uh, so, um, you know, it could be a return to the Republic uh, November 6, 2012. Um, it's, I, I don't know. I, I know so eventually, you know, people will have enough. I mean, if, if, if we make, um, you know, peaceful revolution impossible, then we make a violent revolution inevitable, um, John F. Kennedy. And uh, so eventually, you know, people are going to snap or just wake up and, and um, so hopefully it's this year and realize you know that path of least resistance that truth and freedom can follow I believe is the House of Representatives and uh, it's the more, most realistic it's it's um, you know there's plenty of people in position to uh, you know uh, be elected and um, so um, well Chip Peterson, it's actually uh, been a, a, a pleasure here, and uh, well, not you know, actually been a pleasure, but it's been a pleasure. And um, we have here your website here. Yeah, put, please give the website because I have a lot of statements on there that uh, people may want to read, see where I stand, and also see my resume. It's www.chippeterson.com. Okay, yeah, that's it. Um, C H I P P E T E R S O N. Um, Chippeterson.com. Right. right, and um, and I'll have that um, uh, uh, on the video parts. So, but if someone's just listening audio, that's it. So, uh, I'll say goodbye to you real quick after this interview, and thank you for your time today, sir. Um, and um, you know, uh, so I guess uh, have fun, and um, you, you know, while you're campaigning, and uh, and so people check him out, check out someone that uh, has. Um, you know, uh, as good, if, if not better, credentials than uh, his opponents, and um, his heart's in the right place. Uh, thank you again, Chip. Appreciate oh, thank it. you. I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you and expound on my ideas a little bit more. And, of course, I can tell from your questions that you pretty much agree with a lot of them, so I'm happy to hear that. <laughs> yeah, the Constitution, you know, kind of unites us, and, um, and uh, so, um, well, uh, well, thanks again. Thank you. Bye.